for universidades que están a distancia, the School of Social Sciences and Humanities, and the English teaching major for first and second science. Anyway, it is a pleasure to have you, your presence in this webinar, the actual purpose of teaching English in today's reality, by Alfieri Avilan from Pearson Education. Before we begin this activity, we want to explain the dynamics of this webinar. We appreciate you keep your mics and cameras off at all times to avoid interrupting during the webinar. With the purpose of maximizing the time for every session, we invite you to ask your questions in the chat of this Zoom session. And uh, the questions will be written down by our organizing committee and will be shared with the specialists following their posting order in the chat. We advise you verify that when posting your questions, you are sharing them in the whole group of the session. If any question cannot be answered in this session, the organizing committee will send it to the specialist and he will answer via email to the participants. Alfieri Avilan is a certified master trainer, certified master trainer in dialogue-based selling and negotiation, middle and high school English teacher, teacher of English as a foreign language and marketing specialist. He holds certifications in digital competencies. He has been an academic consultant for over 15 years and currently holds the learning services coordination position for Guatemala and Venezuela. His expertise varies in fields such as consultancy, sales, effective communication, interpersonal and institutional relations, team building and management skills, planning, budgeting, organizational skills, goal setting and follow up, groups training and facilitation, speaking in public. Without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Avila. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's it's great to be back. Uh, it's it's been a couple of years since I think I visited last time Costa Rica and I spent some time at the Met. It's wonderful to have the experience again and, and, and to have these open spaces for uh, these great discussions, especially after what's been happening. I think we need more and more of these uh, scenarios. So we can uh, catch up with the new trends and catch up with what's going on. Things are moving fast and things are moving uh, radically. So I think we need more of these spaces. And speaking of, of past and, and changes, uh, we've been working a lot on trying to catch up with um, what's happening nowadays. Uh, I'm not going to spend time talking about pandemic results and the consequences of what's going on. I think you're well versed on, on what, what has, what's happened lately. Um, what, I've, what I've intended to do today is to actually take a look at uh, what's happened and, and, and the actual uh, impact on the market, on the marketplace. Because in the end, I think it's really interesting to look at what we're doing uh, versus uh, what's happening, what the market is requesting, what the parent people, are we preparing people uh, the correct way? Are we doing what it takes to really, really uh, prepare our learners for the actual world? And English is at the heart and the core of many things that are happening around the globe. And Let's just get started by showing you the outlook of what's happening, what we in Pearson have been doing uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, information, researching, uh, investigating things so we can offer uh, solutions to uh, the actual and current um, situations that present a challenge for English teachers and for the ELT community. Um, let's, let's take a look at the outlook first, okay? What, what's, what's been happening? Uh, we've been 
digging in deeply into uh, the current situation of uh, the marketplace. Why the marketplace? Because what we're sending in the end, uh, for whatever reason, we're sending people out there to work, to develop professionally, to study more, to continue and further in their careers. But we are, are we really doing what, it, what, what we need to do? And that's a question that I think we need to answer today. Take a look at this um, few facts of, of English uh, worldwide. Uh, it, it talks about the relevance and the importance of English. It's been important for many years, but today, with the current situation around the globe, it's more than important. It's necessary and it's critical to, to, to learn to speak English. Take a look at this. And, and that gives us English teachers a house a little bit of a whew, we're safe, um, especially because of uh, all the, the, the job losses that have occurred uh, lately. So we are safe still. Take a look. 85% of the world population use English as official language. So imagine this. This is an, an unprecedented type of data. And it, and, and it rings the bell. It, it, it rings bells everywhere. It, it, it's an alarm. It's, it's, it's monumental. 85% of the world population. That gives us a great deal of opportunities to learn English and to teach English. Then look at what happened in the year 2020. Two billion people learned English. So academically speaking, English is still the preferred language and it's used by two billion people. And a curious fact is that only a third of these figures are native speakers. What does that tell us? It tells us that we, people from all different sort of backgrounds that are not English native speakers, hold and possess English as a means of communication. So English, uh, and this is something that we really need to understand and to really need to communicate to all of our learners because we still think that we need to learn either American English or British English. There is no such thing as American English. And there is no such thing as a British English. Actually, if you go to Britain, the, um, the invasion, in a good way, of the amount of cultures that surround the island is massive. It's impressive. Not to think about what's going on nowadays in, in the United States. In the US, you can see millions, literally millions of immigrants that have come to these or um, land for different reasons, but that actually they, they bring their own culture. And, and without culture, there is no language. So we have to really bust the myth of using American English or British English. It's English around the world. It is spoken by two billion people and only a third of native speakers. So we have to think about this a little bit. And when we are teaching, we have to teach English and not American English or not British English. Now, the other interesting fact is that, and this is something that you, I'm sure that you are aware of, is that 55% of the content that you find in the internet comes in English. So do we need English? Of course we do. We need English for many reasons. We need English for business. We need English. Uh, and, and, and something important, English is the preferred language for business around the globe. If you, if you look at, for example, one of the uh, humongous uh, economical uh, community is the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy is growing and devouring the world as, as, as we know it now. And do they use the native language to communicate for business? No, they don't. They use English. They learn English. Everyone learns English for business, for conducting businesses around the globe. So 
uh, it, it's it's really important to understand. And uh, uh, all these facts are going to actually come to sense when um, when I at the end of, of the presentation you understand why all this data is important to have in hand. Then we have that um, a series of organizations uh, around the, the world, international organizations that use English for communication and that graces who are 85 percent. So what the relevance of English nowadays, more than before, is absolutely crucial. English has become the center of the interest of lots of people for many reasons, business, studying, furthering career. Day in and day out, more people are trained in the use of English. But that's not it. It's not just to teach English. It's to teach English with a specific purpose. Keeping in mind, the interest, the necessity, not only of the job market, but the necessity of people. Why am I learning English? Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to continue uh, furthering my um, academic career at university. And someone, this someone, needs a specific type of English. It's not general English, it's academic English. Then I'm, I'm studying English because I want to get a promotion uh, at work. What kind of English do you need? You don't need academic English. You don't need general English. You need professional English. And this is, these are the things that we need to start considering for our programs. Also, I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about the soft skills, but this is something that goes hand in hand with English, with the EOT community. And we'll see about it in a minute. Look at what happened. We talk about English and the strong relationship with the employability capacity. What happens if I learn English and if I, if I can communicate well in my professional field, then my um, rate of employability increases. But if I only know English, uh, generally speaking, then someone else would come around with uh, better uh, proficiency. So we need to think about what we're doing in the problem in order to really prepare students for the fields they want to develop in. If they want to develop in the academic fields, if they want to use English as a general uh, tool for communication, if they want to learn English for um, diplomacy, for business, then we have to think about the kind of program that we have created. We have to rethink our programs. And I'll tell you why. We, I'm, I'm saying this, for a simple reason, uh, we've come uh, with a long line of research. We've been doing this for many years, and I think we are going to continue to do it for many years to come. One in, in the year 2018, we launched this investigation. It's called the Future of Skills. And what does this tell uh, the world? It tells the world the kind of skills, the kind of things that we're going to need in order to survive, professionally speaking, by the year 2030. Of course, now we have to add the pandemic concept, the, the, the things that have changed, this virtuality that we have faced and we weren't, we weren't expecting. But this, it, it, it's of great importance. And let me show you why. Let me, let me show you a little bit of what happens here. We partnered up with two great companies in the world that are specialists in the area of uh, research and investigation. The Nesta company and the Oxford Martin School, two big uh, league uh, players for this area. So in this, um, in this specifically, in this research, what can we get? We can get lots of, of great insights uh, for us. This is a food, a thought, a food for thought, sorry, for us to use in our problem. Take a look. What's going to happen? Let's just explore a little bit uh, this. So let's see what kind of skills I need in the year 2030 
so that I can succeed in my actual and current job. And, and, and we're going to see what happens with all other jobs. So let's see my chances of survival for the year 2030. Um, let's geographically speaking, obviously, US has a, a more impact in our uh, region. So let's choose uh, the US. So here goes. Uh, I type in my name, obviously, then uh, my year of birth, not getting any younger here, and my job title. I'm an English teacher, and here it is, English language and literature teachers post-secondary. Let's take a look. So let's see what I need, what kind of skills I need to improve. And let's see my chances of survival, and let's compare it to other type of uh, teachers or, or jobs. So I'm going to skip this. And voila. Uh, in the year 2030, I'm going to be 57. That's really not good. Not getting any younger. But what do I need? Take a look. Before we, 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 we check the actual skills and, and the description of what I need to improve so that I can, you know, participate in that 77.4% of chance to grow of my career in the year 2030, let's take a look at um, a comparison in different fields. Um, right here, this is me. And I've got a 77% of chance to grow in the year 2030 with my actual career as a teacher. Teachers are definitely uh, pure gold, especially for what's going on nowadays. Uh, we are the ones that need to think and rethink and, and, and we adapt all the uh, content and the skills and the competencies and whatever it we need in the educational system in order to actually prepare learners efficiently. So we are, we're supposed to be valued very well, right? And I emphasize, I suppose. So let's see, architecture teachers, they've got a 74% chance of growing also. Adult and basic secondary education literacy teachers and instructors, 69%. Take a look. This one, vocational education teachers. Take a look at this. This is really uh, interesting. Vocational careers are taking a huge um, amount of importance today. It's, it's become a link between the, the university and post-secondary uh, post uh, um, uh, studies. Why? Because people are in need or companies um, and, and the job market is in need of specialized hands and they can't wait. So certifications all over the world have become truly important. This is why you see that vocational education teachers have a, a, a high chance of uh, getting jobs uh, by the year 2030, more than us, more than English teachers. And take a look at this. Special education teachers actually decrease a little bit, 70% yeah, of times. So this, this comes to, 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 tell, to tell us we need to stop, think, and reinvent what we're doing. And to, to actually think, are we doing the correct thing to prepare learners for the future? Which is here. Future is not. Tomorrow, the future has just dropped on our laps and, and, and we weren't expecting it, but we're here. So we need to start rethinking what we're doing in our program so that we can actually uh, meet the needs, the actual needs of the job market. And so that we can provide those learners with real, actual uh, tools for them to face this uh, rough reality that we're dealing with nowadays. The competition out there is 
in time, just to say the least. And then what skills do I need uh, to improve so that I can survive in, by the year 2030? Let's take a look. I need learning strategies, uh, such as selecting and using training instructional methods, procedures appropriate for the situation. That means that I need to learn uh, strategies, learning strategies that can be adaptable for the situation. Not the ones I need now, or the ones I've got now. I need new learning strategies, right? Like, for example, things that I need to learn uh, online. How can I study online more effectively? What kind of things do I need to deal with this uh, learning path? And let me tell you something. I was doing a research with a, a consultancy company and, um, and, and they came up with this fact that really, really, really hit me hard in my brain. And, and they came up with this information. It's, it's, we are, uh, we, nowadays, buyers, which is my field, I specialize in sales. Um, in my field, buyers are now categorized as a 4D. They're delusional, the they're disconnected, they're distracted. And they're this, they're, they're, they are overwhelmed with information. So the attention span of 80% of workers in the States has decreased to a 10 second attention span. That is monumentally crazy. Why? Imagine, how, how, how do you get the attention of someone that, whose attention span lasts 10 seconds? This is a challenge, and this happens to teachers as well. Why? Because learners are behind the screen for long periods of time. So we need to come up with this learning strategy, right? So the other, the other set of, of, of skills that I need in my case would be instructing, teaching others how to do something rather than teaching content. And this is, this is a, the eternal discussion. Is it about content? In, in, in our case, is it about grammar? Is it about vocabulary? What, what's the focus? What do I need to do? Well, I need to teach my students how to use those skills. I don't need them to memorize anything. I, I need them to use and apply whatever it is I'm teaching in my class. So the applicability of the content is what we need to focus. So we've got to move away from the use of content. And then I need to prepare myself with active thinking. You see, um, in coaching, there is a three level of listening. First is the listening to, uh, of words. So we listen to what people say, right? That's say, very literally, we hear the words, okay? Then there is a second level, which is listening to the intent, listening to the message behind the words. Here we have to really pay attention and try to look at the uh, body language of the person, the tone of voice, the pitch, uh, the speed, everything that is behind, or, or the echo behind the words. And then there is the third level, which has got to do with something that we teachers develop very quickly, which is the intuition. We can read people very well, we know that, so we have to use this actual third level of listening. It's something that comes in the gut, if you will, so it, it, it's a very, uh, um, perhaps, uh, a kind of uh, concept that is not measurable, not tangible, but uh, that it works. So we have to develop, in my case, I've got to develop these three skills. So my advice, if you've got the time, and I'm going to uh, close this, and I'm gonna post the um, website on the chat so you can visit it. And, and you can do this, and, and, and this is going to help us really profile what we perhaps need in order to improve in, in, in our, in our um, programs. Uh, let's, let's take a moment and think about what we need to improve in our programs. Let's, let's think about that uh, here. Not readable. My apologies. Okay, so 
that's for one thing. That's for the one thing we, we launched in the year 2018. That was three years ago. And we've been doing this. Uh, this is not something new. We, we, we started doing research and investigation. And we, we as I'm going to say in a minute, we were part of a major investigation around the globe in 2002. But before we jump into that, this um, investigation of the future of, of skills was like the, um, this, oh, what do we do now? What can we do in order to uh, use this information we collected from that research and put it to work? What kind of, what, how, how can we offer something truly valuable to the market? And I want to say the market. English teachers, uh, learners of English. So we developed a, an employability framework. And this is interesting because this can tell you the actual reality of what employers are receiving versus what educational institutions are throwing in the market. This is um, a four area uh, framework. Uh, and, and it was done with the help of uh, employers, educators, learners around the around the around the globe. This is not something that happened in the United States. Only. This is something that we try to conduct. We try to give uh, provide validity to our research by including as many uh, countries as possible. And it was both formal and informal research. The findings are quite interesting. Take a look at what happens here. It's not very clear, but uh, I have shared with uh, um, this, uh, um, this article where you're going to find the actual number. So if you can't read it, my apologies, but you're going to receive the information, right? So look at what happened. In the educational system, or uh, yes, in the educational system, 96% of chief officers of, of involved in the academic area think that they are preparing students correctly to face the reality of the job market. 96% of the educational um, uh, system think in general that they prepare people or that prepare learners correctly for the job market. Across the street, the job market, so they're receiving what the pro, that kind of product they receive. They think that only 11% of these reception of these mass of people that come to work or to, to find jobs are actually prepared. It's a humongous gap between what education is doing versus what the job market is receiving. It's incredible. This provides a great deal of opportunities for improving all programs, English programs, math programs, all the programs. This should be a call for an alert. We're not doing the right thing. And it's not us, it's not here's an assessment, it's the investigation, it's the research, it's the job market that is this big. Now, the other thing that we, in which we have a um, major gap of opportunity is in the digital skill. 76% of CEOs are worried about people not getting um, correct training for digital skills. So once again, great opportunity to include our digital. We have included it, obviously, but we need to exploit it. So our programs should have part in where certifications or courses based on the development of digital skills should be going. Then, a term that has been around for 
19 years now, 21st century skills. 90% of graduate recruiters said that 21st century skills are the three most important factors in hiring decisions. That means, once again, 21st century skills, the, four, four, the famous four Cs, collaboration, communication, creativity, and, and critical thinking, are part now of a larger group of soft skills. And this is something that we need to include in our language teaching program. It's something that we must do, and it's something that has been out there for many years. So it's not just about the language, it's about many other areas that we are not now looking upon. And then there is this one. The number one reason why hiring is challenging is a lack of candidates with needed hard skills. That means academic skills. So this brings a different outlook. This brings an entirely different outlook of what we we have been doing. So it's it's my 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 call for attention is that we need to step out of the bubble we're living in and start thinking ahead and looking ahead and looking at what's going on in the market, in the actual market, and start making the necessary changes in, uh, in our programs so that we really provide learners with those soft skills with uh, English with uh, a clear purpose in our cases. Those are two things that we need to include in our program. Soft skills, we do that, and, and, but in, with a purpose. We need to do it with an intention, not because it's part of what we do in terms of our activities, but we really need to think, okay, what skills, what soft skills do I need to include? And this is something that we're going to be looking at in a minute. So we uh, developed this framework and take a look what happened. What's in the middle of all of it? English language. English language is the glue that holds together many of the things that we're doing nowadays in the market. So it's very valuable. The relevance of English that we discussed at the beginning takes a major place here. Take a look. It's, it's, it's the connection between the two major groups of um, competences that we develop. The productivity competences and the transitional competences. Productivity competences, three groups. Transitional, only one. Why? Because these are the things, these are the things that we are learning day by day that we are applying, and it helps us for lifelong learning. We need to understand that concept. And this is where we're going. We need to help learners learn things in order to complete the entire life cycle. They're going to be learning for life. And they're going to be applying what they learn for life. It's not something that happens only at university, that happens at school, or that happens only uh, for a certification. All the skills, all these competences have to be transitional. What does that mean? I have to apply those in my real life, the applicability. So let's take a look at each one of these uh, four components and we are going to understand better our position as English teachers. Let's take a look. The first, obviously, the academic competences, they've got to do with um, the solid foundation of what we learn at school. It's uh, what happens between uh, kindergarten all the way to a doctorate. It's not only K-12 education. Obviously, the foundations are done, are based on K-12. Whatever happens from the moment you uh, start uh, kindergarten all the way to you, you graduate in high school, is the heart, is the core of what you're going to bring into university and your professional life. So everything you learn in terms of the academics happens here 
is the first component of our print. Then we've got the occupational skills. What are the occupational skills? Well, the things that we need to do in our profession. So for teachers, what are our, what, what should be our skills? Well, good level of English, uh, an appropriate pronunciation, if you will. So the things that we do in terms of this, the competencies that we need to perform our jobs much better. Some examples like if you're an engineer, how to calculate. An engineer that does not calculate is not an engineer. And I know that for fact, because my wife is, she calculates everything. She sees the matrix numbers coming down. It's incredible. Then if you're a psychologist, well, your listening skills should be very, very well developed. You need to listen to people, not to hear people, to listen. And then if you're a manager, well, you should deal with your finances better than uh, other, other um, professions, right? So the occupational skills, we've got the academic skills, everything we learn in terms of the academics, of course, everything we study uh, from the moment we jump into kindergarten all the way to a doctorate. Then we've got the occupational skills, which are the things that we need to, to learn in order to perform better in our profession. The third one is the famous soft skill. These are transferable skills. These are things that we need to include. And this is the message. Think about this. We do that. English teachers, teamwork, communication, problem solving, um, obviously learning, technology. We've got lots of this, but the question is, do we actually have a program based on the development of these skills? Do we intentionally develop these skills in the classroom? Are they part of our plan? Are they part of our curriculum? This is the question. And this is something that has been out there for many years. These personal social capabilities have been out there ever since uh, the uh, partnership of the 21st century was uh, created back in the year 2002. This is something that you, I'm sure you all know, and you've seen many times, uh, but this is something that ever since uh, we came up together, and when I say we, it's because Hazel was part of this development in the year 2002, and this beautiful rainbow with the categories of the skills was created. And we started looking ahead and thinking, what was going to change for the new learners of this century? What was going to happen? What kind of uh, skills, what kind of competences uh, will these people need for facing the reality of the new era? So this was created. And at the center, at the heart of, of, of this um, framework, the famous four says was included. The, these were learning and innovate, innovation skills. These were things that uh, even in, and I'm sorry for the commercial, but I, I think it comes handy information. Many of these series that we developed for teaching English included these uh, forces. Everything that we're doing now in terms of uh, material development, uh, whether digital or, or, or printed, uh, certifications, validations, everything we're doing has to do with it. Everything. So English does not escape it. English needs to be um, um, how can I say it? Nurtured, that's the word. English needs, needs to be nurtured by a program, a parallel program that feeds these um, uh, skills, these personal capacities. It's, it's necessary. Why? Because when people learn English, people learn English to communicate, to write in English. They need to write in English directly. They need to send a clear message. They need to co communicate, they need to collaborate, they need to 
to solve problems. Everybody tells that. So at work, English is not just a tool, it's a skill. So as part of this, we start, we need to really start thinking to uh, com complement the English program with soft skills program. It's, it's crucial nowadays. Then the fourth, and I think the most important element of the framework, it's the career knowledge and transitions. These are things that are going to help people move successfully from the world of studies to the job market. And this is going to help them improve in their careers because this is what we need to concentrate on. We need to help learners to move from the content to the applicability. If I can't apply my skills throughout my life, I'm going to succeed. Everywhere I go, I'm going to be employable. I'm going to be desirable for my for careers or uh, a further in professional. So, mm, Keeping up to date with new information is a necessity. It's not optional. We need to uh, understand that once we finish high school or um, whatever school we're at, university, college, it's not the end of it. We need always to be up to date in our career. It doesn't have to, it doesn't mean that we're going to be studying uh, university or doctorates for the rest of our lives. It means that we can um, upgrade our skills with certifications, with courses, with uh, digital validations, if you will, which is the new trend in, 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 in education. You study online and then you receive a digital match for being a specialist on uh, teaching uh, uh, adults. So, for example, uh, you must continue learning. This learning process should not end. Definitely, and most definitely. And, and this is something that we consider a must nowadays in every program. The soft skills, something that is needed. And th there is something here that is not, is not present, but I would say digital skills, digital competence. It's something that we also need to add and have make a joint venture between soft skills program, digital skills program, and English. They go, the three of them go hand in hand. Especially now, everybody's studying online. English is not sacred. So, why not create a program that really tackles all these three areas? It would be a boom. It would be great. The greatest program ever. And then um, the, the, the other parts, how to show, showcase certification, financial accomplishment. LinkedIn is the best uh, example I can, I, I can think of when you have all this together. In LinkedIn, the more you show off, if you will, the more desirable you become in the job market. So if you teach your students, if you complete all these courses, all these digital badges, all these certifications, you need to place them in all your social media. And that creates your own brand. Uh, and that creates uh, 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 an image of you uh, that is going to be hard to, to replace or hard to look elsewhere. So we have these uh, four um, groups of uh, elements that make up for the employability framework. And why do I bring this into an English teaching conversation? Well, I think the validity has spoken for itself. We are not uh, teaching English only for the main purpose of social communication. We're teaching English for different reasons, right? And that's, uh, speaking of reasons, it's, it's one of the things that we understood when we launched or when we started digging a little bit deeper into the stuff. And uh, this is something that is not new, but this is something that I, I, I wanted to revisit 
because it, 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 the validity links to the purpose of what we're doing. What are we teaching? Are, are we up to date in the teaching of English? Are, are we understanding what the job market needs and are we doing the correct thing in our, our English program? So let's revise a little bit what happened in, with the CEFA and, and then why the um, development of the GSE, not as a substitute, but as a complement for the CEFA. Uh, let's take a look at what happened with the CEFA. Um, when it was launched in 2001, if I'm not mistaken, 2000-2001, the purpose of creating a framework for measuring uh, linguistic competences in the English language was seen as the purpose of communicating verbally in English. There were certain things that uh, were taken into consideration to develop the framework, which was very good at the moment, but we left lots of gaps to be filled. The first gap is it's called the CEFA for a reason, because it was created for European speakers common European framework of reference. We are in Central America. We are not part of Europe. So our cultural background is, even though we've got lots of inheritance from the Euro European continent, we don't hold exactly the same cultural aspect as Europeans do. So that's the first difference, okay? Second difference, when it was created, it was thought for the, uh, measuring the ability to or the, the, the skill to speak and to communicate, as I said uh, two minutes ago, verbally in English. And the focus was that. So 65% of the CANDU statements were meant to measure the speaking skill in the range of the band A2, B2. Now, uh, I, I, always, I always say, um, what's the first uh, communicative skill that we develop? It's listening, isn't it? And it happens when? It happens very young, at a very young age, you're not even born. You are still in mommy's womb, very comfortable and cozy. So during the 16th week of pregnancy, more or less. So what happens here? There is it's not balance. It wasn't properly balanced. So there, there are many things that I can bring up here and, and we can discuss about the stuff. I'm not saying the stuff is, no, I'm saying the stuff was created like this and it needed an improvement. So the other thing about the stuff, I'm going to click, click, click here, is the path of learning the losing of details to progress. What happens if you are A1, you are in the band A1, what does that mean? How do I know when I'm at the, at the bottom of, of, of the band or when I'm very close to the upper band? How do I measure that? How do I know that? It's really confusing. When you're, in, when you're with the band, what are you? You are an A1 for 380 hours of instruction. Then if you want to be an A2, then you have to spend 1,019 hours all. So um, it's, it's the actual uh, challenge of the measurement of progress in, in the CEFA was really, really difficult to tackle. Then uh, what I said uh, previously, it, it was created and developed for European speakers. So again, uh, I can spend the entire afternoon uh, boring you to death with facts and information about the CEFA, which is not the case. I just wanted to present the view of why the global scale of English was launched, was developed, created, and has been a success, and is going to really uh, cover the pain point of 
creating programs adapted to the market and to the necessities of the students and the market. The first thing about the uh, development of uh, the Global School of English is it, it, the fact that it was global. It, it's called global for a reason, it's not global because we loved the name. It's global because there were about 6,000 teachers across 50 countries who participated in the development of the Canvas site. Lots of teachers from uh, all over the place. I have to say that I was part of the Latin American team who worked for the development of the Candle statements of the global skills. That's the first, that's the first advantage. The other advantage is instead of bands, we created a numerical um, type of scale that allowed teachers, programs, learners to see progress more efficiently, more effectively. Uh, for example, in this band, you need, according to the investigation of the staff, you need 380 hours of instruction to complete the band. Whereas um, when you are using the global scale of English, you're measuring uh, the, the, the minimum um, measuring point is uh, three, uh, levels of the scale. So that means that you've got 24 hours to see progress, at least to see progress. So uh, that's for one thing. Uh, there are many other things that we need to, to focus here, and it's, uh, I'm going to share the, the, the website with you in a minute. But this is, I think, uh, I want to concentrate, and now is where everything I've spoken before uh, really comes to uh, a sense. And it's a fact that when the development of the GC took place, there was something that was a breakthrough and it was, it was the actual and the correct use of pragmatics in order to develop the kind of statements that were needed for different purposes. For one thing, in the year 2015, when we launched the um, Global Scale of English, for the first time, there was a framework created specifically for young learners. That didn't exist before. The SAFA was focused for adults. So we created a framework that measured the competences, the linguistic competences of young learners from the sixth year of life to the 14th. And even when, with the upgrade of the SAFA uh, back in the year 2018, uh, the framework for young learners was uh, from the seventh to the 14th year of age. So there is one more year of difference between the SAFA and the Global School of English. So it's come, the Global School of English has come to improve the SAFA in different forms. Then we created a professional framework for English. People that have to do with the job market. I'm learning English because I want, uh, I'm going, I need it at my, I need it at, at my work. If I want to further my career in the company, I need to learn English with that specific thing in mind. It's not general English, it's professional English. And you will see the differences in, in the Canvas statements. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. Or if I'm, um, I'm a graduate, uh, a college graduate, and I need to further my academic studies in an English speaking country, for example, uh, and I need to prepare to have take the PTE academic or the TOEFL, then I need a program that really prepares students based upon these specific needs. What do we have? Well, we've got the uh, Global Scale of English Learning Objectives for Academic English. Because we need different competencies, we need different learning objectives to learn English according to the necessity. And where do we find all this? We've got this marvelous website that contains all the information 
on the global scale of England. And you can, you can get the learning objectives for free. You can download it. We're not charging anything because this is like the Staffer. This is the proof of the Staffer, and the Staffer is free for everyone. And it's been so useful. This has been so useful that by the time the upgrade of the Staffer was launched, they decided that the, 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 the um, uh, European community, uh, the Council of Europe, sorry, decided to tag 50 of our uh, newly created Candu statements and include them in this new uh, development of the 20th. So you can download this for free. Uh, there is something else that you can do. Uh, everything you need to know about the uh, global scale of English is here. Where, where did we get this? Well, it's all here. You can go through the research and see what we did. And here, all the papers are available for you to look at, to read. There's a lot of information. But what I'm saying is, this is a huge, a monumental investigation, and it has created a huge impact in the ELT world around the globe. This is not something that happened in the region. The closest example that we've got here in the use and the improvement of, of, of the framework of English in, in a country is in Panama. We had specialists from the GSE team brought to Panama and worked with the Panamanian government at the time, um, President Varela. And we used the GEC as the first pillar to create the Panama Bilingue program, which is, um, I'm thinking this, and, and it's maybe it's going to happen again. There are going to be a second round of Panama Bilingue, uh, hopefully next year. So it's been important. And, and there, there have been 10 million of learners that have been impacted positively with the use of the GSA. Where do you find this information? You find it here, case study. We're posting and we're upgrading all the information here so that you can see how people use it around the globe and how effective it is. So we, why not use indeed and, and here, and let me see here. This is Carlos Varela, the, the president of Panama, ex-president of Panama, and he, he was witness of what happened in Panama when we launched this uh, program. And everything is here. All the case studies, how impactful the, 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 the GSC has been everywhere. But that's not, that's not what, what I wanted to, to show you. Well, yeah, I don't want to want to show you, but this is not the core of, of the conversation. What I'm, I don't want to deviate myself here. The objective of this talk is for you to offer these learning objectives and a teacher toolkit, which you can use to personalize, to create tailor-made programs of English. Let me show you. You go here. You go to the talk, and then you start playing with the talk. I hope some of you are familiar with it. And what this gives you is the opportunity to create your own personal program. So let's say that you take a look. You want to create an academic program. You've got the chance here. If you want to create a professional program for uh, young, uh, for adults, those that are going to the job market and, and, and be employable, and alongside. Uh, we've got um, a great um, program, which is called Person Abilities. It's based upon a series of, uh, you can get your digital badges at the end of, you have a diagnostic test in different, in six different soft skills. And then you've got the course, and then you've got the badge at the end. So you can merge this. And this uh, tool helps you, for example, creating the program. So let's say that for the sake of the exercise, you want to create a program for adults and you want to choose uh, the language skills, obviously, or you can use even commun communicative categories, different communicative categories for you to create a very powerful program, very specific. Program. So let's say 
uh, you want to do the listening program uh, for adults. And you are uh, profiling your students to leave at a level B1, just to say uh, something. So you click on show results. And this is what happens. The tool creates the list of all listening um, can-do statements that the program needs. From the lowest point of measuring all the way to the highest point, but we're going to spend a lot of time with it. The thing is that you can click on download, all right? And if you create, a, a, you select all, and then you create a, an Excel document, and it's downloaded like this, right? So what you, what you actually have in your hands, it's a tool that allows you to personalize your program. How personalized? Well, you can revisit this document and say, okay, my program specializes in this, this, and that. So I don't need to, uh, for example, I don't need this. This is way too basic. You can understand basic questions about what things are in their immediate surroundings. So if you don't need that, then you can just simply delete it. So you can revisit the entire uh, program, make it tailor-made according to your actual current student's necessity. Or take a look. You can also create your own grammar uh, program according to uh, grammar category. So for example, adjectives, adverbs, Close. Then you choose here, for example, this. Let's choose this and let's work. Let's play a little bit with um, with the global scale of English. So you say, okay, I need the program for uh, students that are going to reach A to plus. You click on results and then again you get all the grammatical uh, categories, can do statements that you need to include in your program. And you can get resources for free, right? That you can download, right? And if you open here, take a look at what happens. It gives you all the categories here. And it tells you example structures, show more, and you have more information. So you can actually play with this teacher toolkit that you're going to find in your. Uh, website for the global scale of English. This will allow you, and let me show you here for a minute. Um, sorry, this is that um, research for the future of skills, but take a look. These are the skills or, or the frameworks for the different uh, GSE for professional English. Take a look. Let me show you how different they are. Take a look. You can read this and you can see that we created a specific kind, a specific kind of statements according to the necessity. This is going to help you create, not, not create the programs, but perhaps to profile your programs a bit better. Because the, the, the intent is, uh, for us teachers to really tackle the issue of preparing learners according to the real necessity. Why are they studying English? Are they studying English because they want to continue uh, uh, university uh, or, or they want to continue college careers or they want to improve uh, or further in their academic study? Then we have the um, the adult um, academic, this is it, adult learners, sorry, this is the professional, this is the young learners, here. Global scale of English for academic English. And you can find the differences here. You have the, uh, look, again, they've been branded with this, um, 
little sign here that says academic, right? Can identify common features of an academic aspect, for example, when you see this piece because we created it and then we use all these kits. We also use the basis of the CEFA. Everything has been created over the CEFA and has been improved. And we also have come up with a um, assessment framework which tackles the uh, obvious element of assessment in English language learning that I, that that is but it shows us and uh, allow me to to show you it shows you uh, both um, productive skills and speaking and writing and it gives you the categories and it's a rubric that you can use for free you can adapt it to your necessities, to your programs, and then use this international um, framework in order to improve the programs you're working with. This is going to this is this has come to actually resolve the problem of tailoring programs based on learners and market necessities. So my call for you teachers, my call for, for, for uh, um, representatives of, of the program at universities is to take a moment, take a step back, think of what you need for your programs, where you need to improve your program. And the tools are there, the tools are for free. And this is something that we have come to contribute to the ELT community. So. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm going to be sharing the uh, links on the um, chat box. And now I think it's time we've got time for questions and answers. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go straight to the question. Uh, Julie, have we got questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, I'm reading one here from Isaac. Okay. Uh, it says, by the year 2030, what kind of materials and resources can we teachers see us using? We're using digital books, yes. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think by the year, look, what I don't, I don't think, and this is something that we've been discussing for some time now at Pearson, uh, we don't see printed material uh, fading away soon. Um, of course, the, the use of digital components has increased, I don't know, 110%, if you want to say, if you want me to give you a number, it's increased rapidly uh, and radically, of course, because of the situation. Uh, I don't think this situation of the pandemic is going to stay forever. We're going to deal with it. Vaccination is taking place. Of course, we still have a long way to go in terms of resolving the issue of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, but apart from that, I think that sometime we're going to go back to uh, hybrid or, or, or blended formats of, of learning. So I think we're going to still use uh, much of the printed versions of material. So um, I think that's, that should resolve the, the first question. Then there is a second question. And it's, if the proposal is to go beyond teaching English as language, having bilingual professionals, would English teachers be replaced by this new English professional market? I don't think so. I don't think teachers won't be replaced easily. Uh, if you specialize yourself in training um, learners, not only teaching English, but training students for developing, for example, soft skills, if you, you can run a, a master trainer for, for, for um, soft skills, so you're prepared. Now, I don't think teachers are going to be replaced anytime soon. Um, I, have, I have another question from sure. Viridiana, so I don't know if you want me to read it for you. Please. 
Good. Uh, well, first she says, that's great to know that the publishing company you belong to have been working to complement English program with the necessary skills to be developed by learners. However, how do we as teachers who have to work with a syllabus already given to us can improve our program for kids? Oh, that's great changes always start at the foundations of every system. It's not the system per se that needs to be changed. It's what we do in everyday lessons. If you, if you, my recommendation is to start small. Start including soft skills in your day-to-day -day activity, in your plan. But let's do it with a purpose, with an intention of using uh, and, and explaining and telling students this activity is not only for English, it's also for developing soft skills. So becoming aware of what you're doing in the classroom or online, in this case, truly brings a lot of sense to what you're doing. So my advice, if, if the syllabus is ready, just add. Uh, you don't need to change the entire curriculum. You don't need to, to change uh, the Ministry of Education in order to start making these small changes in your classroom, preparing learners with actual uh, and current uh, trends. Yes. Well, yesterday, some students had the opportunity of visiting uh, one of the exhibition rooms, mm -hmm. but some others probably didn't have that chance. So I don't know if it's possible for you to share the link where they can have access to the resources that you showed today. Um, what I'm going to do, Margo, is I'm going to be sending you, uh, let me see if I can actually, uh, I sent you an email with information on, 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 on the framework of employability. There is the uh, website that I just posted from the Global School of English, uh, the uh, skills research I'm going to be reposting it now and you can download everything there everything is uh, right there perfect thank you no problem and we have another question now this one is from Carolina she asks is it necessary to have a certification that shows that we teach soft skills? Right, yes, it, it's, we have implemented a program which is called Person Abilities. And uh, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be sharing with you the information on Person Abilities. It's a program uh, that contains, uh, we, we created our own, uh, in Pearson, we created our own framework for uh, Person Abilities. Um, it, 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 it develops six groups of soft skills. Obviously, the four C's, self-management and leadership. So the, and why, why did we choose these six um, soft skills? Because it's what we found out it was useful in the research we launched before creating this. So the market requires people with uh, abilities for self-management. And especially now that we're doing all these crazy things online and you, and you, and you go, you can spend hours and hours behind the scenes, uh, uh, but you need to, 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 to deal with all these changes. So self-management is crucial nowadays. Leadership is a term that I don't think I have to dig in very much for you to understand how important leadership is nowadays. That is not managing people, it's leading people, which is completely different. So we need to train ourselves in those. And so we have this program and there's this, this six, um, uh, sorry, skills, soft skills, and we provide a batch at the end of the course. We've got a diagnostic test, which is online. And then you have the course per se, all the content, which is obviously online. And at the end, uh, there is a batch, uh, a digital uh, validation for this uh, program. So, and, and it's something, if you allow me uh, one more minute, I, I, I want to show you something. Uh, 
uh, Vant right here. Um, I don't want you to read my mails. I just want to show you uh, what I mean by this digital badging, which is really useful. If you look at my mail, hold on a minute. In three, two, one. Sorry, my internet is a little bit slow. Aha. This is the digital. Where is aha? You see, this here is what we call the digital badges. This this is my certified master trainer for adults, and this is my uh, digital literacy. And when you click there, it takes you to a specific uh, website where all the information on your specific competences are. So that actually fits into the fourth category of the employability framework. Remember the transitional skills? So this is something that if you look me up in my LinkedIn, I've got there the link. So you click there and it takes you to the Acclaim website. Um, Acclaim is the organization that provides uh, all the, let's say, the uh, green light for all this uh, badging and, and competences. So, yes, we have that. I think I extended myself a little bit more than necessary. My apologies. Good. I don't know if we have more questions, people. You can post them in the chat. As soon as uh, we close the call. I'll be sending uh, Akira part of the information that I was missing, the personability brochure. So you can please uh, resend it to the participants. Perfect. Yeah, we can do that. Beautiful. Okay, so I think there are no more questions, right? It appears so. All right. So uh, thank you so much for your participation, Alfieri. We really appreciate it. It's like very interesting information for all of us uh, in, to take into account for all our teaching programs. 